Coming to the stage now is Lynn Teo, Chief Marketing Officer at Northwestern Mutual, where she oversees brand strategy, product and digital marketing, plus consumer insights and market research. She's joined by moderator Musa Tariq for a fireside chat about the magic of culture and consumer connection. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, by the way, I, I know Vineet well, and uh, how he interviews is actually how he spends his weekends uh, <laughs> in front of a whiteboard. It's uh, very true. Um, Lynn, when was the last time you were in a club? This is OG. <laughs> this is uh, old school. I cannot remember the last time. Maybe Webster Hall, circa 97. Oh, <laughs> Let's just throw away the questions and talk about that. Sure. Um, following on from the, the Vineet conversation, actually, um, what is your definition of uh, a modern marketeer? Mm -hmm. And then also, more importantly, when did you first realize that you wanted to work in marketing? Excellent question. Um, I think a modern marketer is extremely attuned to the business, right? I think that's the bottom line. A modern marketer understands that marketing is just a toolkit to help you drive the enterprise's business goals. Um, and for me, that realization came not early on in my career. I was sharing with Musa that my, uh, my first gig out of grad school was I was a human factors engineer in Bell Labs, right? That couldn't seemingly, yeah. couldn't be further away from becoming a marketer. But I think that that came to light for me when I crossed over to the client side. Uh, that's about 10 years ago. I was, um, you know, on the agency side after Bell Labs. And then, you know, kind of this desire to make business impact was what drove me to the client side. And it was also a way to test yourself, to make sure that all the things that you've proposed to the client when you're at agency side actually delivered. Yeah. yeah. Vineet did actually talk about this clickbait around the, the death of the CMO and the fact that we're trying to make it worse. Do, yeah. you, do you have a point of view on that? I would just say next. Okay, good. <laughs> Great. Go there. Um, where do you look for inspiration and how do you bring it into a, a financial organization? Sure. Um, I think this speaks to my roots. Uh, having been a human factors engineer, usability practitioner, I start with the insights. I start with that power of deeply understanding humans and uh, connecting what we do as marketers to that need, right? That need could be highly emotional. That need could be drawn by a trend. Uh, when I think about fire, right? Uh, financial independence, retire early. Think about the... Um, the desire to use FinTalk as a way of getting the information. So for me, I think it's all about, you know, being very, very attuned to what needs are and to go there as your first stop of inspiration. Because I think increasingly, consumers are not looking for marketing uh, to push a product, but consumers are looking for marketing to understand, you know, the various need states of people and to be able to shore up a service or an offering that truly impacts people's lives um, you know, very positively. And so I think that mission-driven aspect of a brand is now becoming almost like the price of entry. Yeah. Um, you, you just launched a new campaign recently. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, I read that it took a year yeah. for you to collect all the consumer insight and analytics behind it. Can, yes. can you talk a bit more about that? Because first of all, we all talk about the importance of insight, yes. and often we're like rushed to do it in a really short period of time. Yes. That's where yes. Susie is amazing. Yeah. Uh, but, but you took a year to do that. Can you talk a bit more about that and then how the campaign came to life? Sure. Um, well, I think to clarify, the year didn't mean like we just went off and did a bunch of call and quant and kept doing more and more of it. Um, what we did was we stretched out the cadence, right? So right from the very beginning, we teed off what we call our planning and progress study, which is for those of you who um, go to the Northwestern Mutual site, you'll see it's something we've done over many years where it's the state of financial uh, well-being of people, what consumers want. And that's run by our PR and comms team. And I, I, I always refer to it as the crown jewel of the company. It's really a pulse mm -hmm. on what really matters. And so we went there. You know, There was one of the studies that talked about the advisor advantage and what people look for and what they got out of it. Uh, we also look at the needs of millennials. We look at kind of all of the emerging demands that people have. Um, and we use that as a starting kernel. 
we, we realize that the age of people looking for a financial advisor has been trending down over time, right? For the boomers, it was close to 50 years old. But we're finding now that among millennials, that the 29-year kind of uh, year old stage of life is when our consumers are actually actively looking. So wow. that's, that's a good sign, right? What, can I ask, what do you think is, who in this room has a financial advisor just out of curiosity? Yes, that would be a great question. Just a smattering of heads. Uh, I, I, I wish I, I don't have one and I wish I had one a lot sooner, but what, yes. what do you think is driving that, um, that, that, that age coming down of people who are like, hold on a second, I need I to need. now bring someone in? I think it's a couple of things, right? Um, I think the state of the economy has made it very clear that you have to be starting early and planning for your financial life. And I also think there is agency in the younger set, right? This notion of, you know, if something's not working for me, I need to try to find a solve for it. Yeah. So I think it's a combination of the state of the economy. Uh, it's the, um, the desire and drive to kind of have agency and take control of your life. I think those are all factors that have kind of led to that very natural demand natural inclination and interest, if you will. But the inclination and interest doesn't necessarily translate into the actions. And therein lies, you know, I think the, uh, the approach that we took for the campaign. So we started out by saying, building on that insight, um, what is the brand being positioned? How do we speak about ourselves? How do we show up? Uh, do we show up in the right places? And when we do, what do we say? Does it sound like everyone else? Is it believable? Can they trust us? And so that was kind of like the starting kernel of our message positioning study. And again, throughout that year plus, at every juncture we refined, we consumer tested. We started with concepts. We landed with a better way to money, but I can tell you that in May of 2023, we started in a different place, you know, a person for you or, you know, creating your financial future, you know, knowing what your, your, your future goal looks like, right? So there are many different variations, but I think the important thing is to layer on your learning and your testing and never work off the assumption that you got it right the first time. Um, and then that kind of branched into even our ad spot narrative, right down to our visual design, you know, how would people think and feel about us if we appear this way versus another. We did neural testing. We did facial analysis. So that year plus of um, a very thoughtful testing gave us the confidence that every step of the way, every element of the brand from positioning right through to the ad spot, to the messaging, to the tagline, that they all kind of held together and delivered what the consumers wanted yeah. and what resonated with them. So that, I feel like that's kind of the due diligence and the homework. I, we, I mean, we spoke about this briefly in that like the, the, the biggest issue I've seen in our industry around new brand campaigns, new brand moments is they are, a lot of them are ego driven, right? Yes. Like what's, what's this beautiful work that wins me loads of awards? Yeah. Um, and again, when I started watching your campaign, I was like, oh, that's where this is going. But it wasn't that. It was very much about like making people like myself feel like I need a financial advisor. Yeah. Like, do you see that as a uh, happens too often in this industry? Or like, how do you manage that? Like wanting to make great work that is beautiful, but at the same time, make effective work that actually drives the bottom line for your business. Yeah, the pragmatist in me, Musa, always goes with effective work yeah. as being the foundation. Um, so, you know, I think you have to remain true to who you are as a brand. And if you recall what I, how I opened today's conversation, you always go back to the insight. What's the pain point? What's that powerful moment of connection? And I'm glad to hear, Musa, that oh, yeah. you felt compelled because that's not by accident. You know, the stories we told, the scenarios, even the way we position the role of the financial advisor, the language. Uh, we, we came up with this thing called the trifecta that grounded our brand work. It's advisors who see you and know money. 
It's uh, having the right breadth of products and solutions, which become your levers, right, as a financial advisor to help you plug the blind spots. Blind spots was a very key insight. We found that it didn't matter which segment you belong to. You could be making 125,000 of household income, or you could be uh, ultra high net worth. We found that about 80% of people who had plans did not feel confident that you know they, they had everything considered. So this notion of a blind spot, simple as it might be, was actually a very, very deep insight because we found it resonated regardless. And so we built the role of the financial advisor and what we communicate as you know the competencies, the depth of experience, the empathy. It's a person who speaks to you in a very diligent and in a very real way, a better way to money. Yeah. It doesn't get more simple than that, but we want it to compel action. One of the best things about not working for a big company is now I feel like I can just say whatever's on my mind. Um, and I, I, I just, it just annoys the shit out of me, to be brutally honest, about the, the way that awards and the way that some CMOs are celebrated for the work they, they've done, even though their business is not doing well at all. Yeah. And so I, I really commend you for the work in, in making it and focusing on the effectiveness. And I think you should, you'd win my award, just to be clear, Lynn. Yeah. Um, Question for you, what stands in the way of engaging and connecting with consumers? Like, what are the common misses that people make, in your opinion, like, yeah. when it's not effective? I think it's assuming that you got it right. And that's a, that's a death spiral. Um, and if, if I can, I'll share with you uh, the story of how we landed with our ad spots that required a pivot. And the day is seared in my mind, the 3rd of March this year. Um, the reason being that, um, just for a little bit more context about Northwestern Mutual, we're a B2B to C uh, brand, right? And the only way that our product reaches the end consumer, you, is through our 7,000 plus, close to 8,000 financial advisors all over the US. And so the legacy of Northwestern Mutual is 167 years. Wow. We've, we've kept our promises. We, our origins and our roots are were a insurance company. Um, but over time, you know, we believe that we've come through with a very proprietary approach to financial planning. It's a comprehensive financial planning that looks after what we call your, the risk aspect of your life, but also the wealth side of your life, mm -hmm. right? And those two things actually work together in a very complementary way. Uh, and so if I could share with you the story, so we came in with the assumption of an ad spot concept. We brought our financial advisors in uh, and we do this twice a year, in the spring and in the fall. And we shared the concept with them. We shared with them the storyboards. And there was this death silence in the room. And you knew that it wasn't hitting home. And so it opened up a very frank and open conversation. They're like, well, the ad spot, while it was an attempt to be humorous, to garner attention, was not authentic to who they were. They felt that one of their biggest value propositions was growing up with their target audience from the time you're 29 all the way through to when you have a family, you know, and this notion of even helping your client plan their legacy, that, that con con uh, continuation was very important to them. They also felt that what we had come through as our first tagline, right, better questions, better answers, better way to money, didn't quite hit the, the notion of the conversation. And conversation means it's bi-directional. Yeah. Conversation means there's a joint goal, right? And so those were the nuances of the feedback that were given to us on the 3rd of March, and we were planning our brand launch, and we felt tremendous responsibility as a marketing organization to pause and to say, we're gonna listen to everything that our advisors are telling us, and then we're gonna replan uh, with our creative team, with our agency. That, for me, is a hallmark of a team that is willing to do the right thing and not allowing you know, the vanity of something. Because it's easy to say, you know what, we got this, thank you for your comments, we will 
go on on our merry way and continue, but we literally re kind of reconceptualized, you know, our narrative. And then after March the 7th, pretty much by about April first week, we kind of put concepts in front of them, honed our, our, our script. So for me, I think that's one miss for a lot of brands. You feel like you're too invested, yeah. so you don't want to pivot. But I always feel that you are responsible. You have to be responsible to your brand to it's do a, that. It, it's a tough conversation to have, and you know, uh, at Nike, they used to kill work all the time. Some yes. of the greatest work you've ever seen that cost so much money, they used to kill, and yes. everyone was very comfortable with that decision because it was the right thing to do. Exactly. Yep. Can I change change topic for a second, and can we talk about people? Um, sure. When you and me spoke for the very first time, we, we bonded over the the marketplace today. I, you know, I I recognise that there are so many people right now who are out of work, yes. who are looking for jobs. Um, a lot of people are unhappy in their current work. Yes. Like, what did, what do you think the reason is behind this? Like, fact that so many people are just kind of discontent with work, particularly in the marketing world today. That's a really good question. I think that self-examination, Musa probably started, you know, with COVID. I, I think everyone just took a, a deep look at their lives and, and at their priorities and, you know, kind of, kind of, they were trying to figure out, you know, what is that meaning and purpose in my life? So I do think there are shades of that that are still remaining as marketers evaluate. I think the other aspect, and I think Vineet mentioned it, we're kind of morphing into this discipline of specialists. Yeah. But what that really means is you have to stay at the cutting edge of everything that you do. And I think that adds some stress to people, right? Because you feel like, well, if I'm not at the cutting edge, am I still relevant? And I think the antidote to that is to really be mindful about reading, learning, consuming, go across industries, right? Find relevant nuggets. I think some of that malaise, if you will, might come from this maybe chipping away at your confidence of whether you have what it takes to be successful as a marketer. And therein lies kind of the relevance of your opening question, which is, what is a modern marketer? Yeah. And I've always believed that marketing benefits from um, disciplines, whether it's data, digital, AI, uh, CRM, uh, I think it's a discipline that is inherently connected to so many other functions in an organization. And it is one that requires you to be kind of top notch in your ability to, and which is why I go back to the business. Like, are you doing something in your day to day that you feel confident aligns with whatever the business is, is setting out to do? I feel like that needs to be your North Star. So you're saying that, uh, well, this is again a, a, an open conversation that happens a lot these days around yeah. like, should I come to work for purpose? Yeah. Do you, do you think that is a, a true statement? Do you think that's changed in recent years? I think it is more important now than before because if you're aligned in your purpose, right, at Northwestern Mutual, we exist to free Americans from financial anxiety. Yeah. That's a pretty powerful statement. And anyone who chooses to get behind that understands that their role is bigger than them. I remind myself that every day, right? I look at the struggles that people have, you know, in their financial lives, and I have deep empathy for them. And so I think purpose is probably more salient now than it was 10 or 15 years ago. Why? Because the purpose is the alignment of your values. Yeah. Values of the individual with values of the organization. Well, I, I worry that the pendulum is swinging back. So I think in the last couple of years, you've got a lot of people who are, oh, we need to be purpose driven. And then as the economy gets tougher, yes. the more stress from the, you know, my senior leadership team, yes. I feel like what's going to happen is purpose slowly comes out. And I, I actually think the companies that will survive are the ones that can hold on to it. Right. Uh, and have clear goals and purposes like, like yours. That's right. And if you feel like you're in a place or in a position where there isn't that alignment, then I think the, the ask is for you to be reflective about what that could be. Mm -hmm. And if it, if it is that you're in a job to, you know, to check the boxes and be able to have a paycheck, you know, that's fine. But you go into it 
knowing that that's your goal, and then you find your purpose outside of your profession, right? No one says that we all have to find our purpose in our profession, and you should honor that if that is exactly what, you know, you wake up every day and you're like, this is not doing it for me. I need to find my purpose maybe outside. So I think we should all be honest with what we need. Can you go back to um, your early days and transitioning from being an engineer to a marketing person? Yeah. I think that's going to also happen a lot more like as, yeah. as the world changes and transitions. Like, how do you deal with transitions? What's your advice to people going through transitions and change? Yes. Um, well, first of all, I think for me that transition, um, that the common thread was systems thinking. And I think increasingly, marketing is about systems thinking, right? You can't be just thinking about activities or tactics in a silo, but you have to think what comes before and after it. So really, that transition for me was taking a kernel of skill set that I knew I was analytical, I like to think about things holistically, and trying to find many other avenues for that to be applied, right? So for me, that transition was about you know, kind of going to what the commonality is and then expanding and then being very creative about the avenues, right? So I think about, okay, well, well when, I, when, I, when I approach social media marketing, for me, I'm very attuned that it doesn't exist on its own. It's an ecosystem where social media feeds .com, right? And it feeds on media. And so being able to design, you know, kind of a system that takes advantage of all the connectedness of marketing, I think is kind of one of my superpowers. So I would ask anyone who's considering a transition to really ground yourself on what your superpower is and then how you can build that bridge, you know, maybe mm. to an adjacent, um, an adjacent role. Love that, I love that. Um, going back to then modern marketing and then the future of marketing. Yeah. How, how do you, think people should prepare for it, what excites you about what's coming, yep. what excites you about the future of being in this role? Yeah, well, I think that AI certainly, you know, is waiting to be harnessed in its fullest, right? As I think about... Um, do, you, do you use it in your day-to-day? -day? I do. I mean, my teams are starting out with uh, tools where you can test subject lines, you can actually create subject lines, we ingest all of our brand guidelines. So my team is in the early stages of experimenting. Um, the concept of a segment of one gets me really excited because what someone needs to convert what someone needs to take action and be persuaded. There are just too many combinations and variations and permutations. So AI has that capacity. Can you explain the segment of one? Se segment of one. So, you know, in traditional marketing, right, yeah. you identify your three to five yeah. target segments. And then broad swath, right, you come up with your tactics and your activities that would address as many of those people as possible. But when you think about segment of one, every individual kind of acknowledges where you are in that process of you know, uh, understanding what you need as a consumer, which is a function of your expertise, which is a function, have you spoken to anyone before? What have you interacted online? What have you read, right? Like just the possibilities are endless. So I think brands have the promise of being able to connect with you in a way that is just so relevant to, and timely. Yeah, I, uh, a little secret for those of you who have kids. The other day I was on a, a work call and Zane, my five-year-old, was just in one of those moods where he needed attention. And I don't know what happened, but I was like, went on to chat GPT and I was like, hey, I'm busy on a call. Can you enter Zane Zane for five minutes? He loves planes. He loves cars. Go. And I literally put the phone next to Zane. And 20 minutes later, these guys are playing planes together. And like, the chat GPT is pretending to be air traffic control and Zane's got his planes all over. See? And I'm, I'm embarrassed to say that out loud because it's kind of bad parenting. <laughs> but at the same time, it was also kind of genius. So I don't know if I should take credit for it or not, but I, I just, I'm just throwing it out there if you choose to use it. Well, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, <laughs> sir. It might also work with husbands and wives. I don't know, but... Uh, right. But yeah. I, right. I think it's fascinating, and I, I, I'm excited by it. I, I'm excited by the optimism behind AI. There's, yeah. there's way too much 
pessimism, negativity, oh my God, will we be in a job, will we not be in a job? I, I think, um, you know, Scott Galloway, for all his flaws, he talks about the idea that, like, it will only take people's jobs who are not embracing it. Yes. Uh, and, and, and using it and trying it. And I think the irony of it is that I find that we all talk about it a great deal. Yes. But very similar to social media 15 years ago, people were talking about it but not using it. That's right. Right? And, and I right. think that we, I have to just kick myself up the ass every day and be like, right, find 10, 15 minutes to be trying it and using it. Yeah. Because otherwise, I'll just get lazy and not, not adapt in time. Agreed. I mean, wor being worried about your job situation is missing the point entirely. Totally. Um, in the financial services space, you know, we, we have this push-pull, right, of the human and the importance of having that human, but with the technology, right, with whether it's robo-investing. And I think AI gives us a really exciting time for us to reconcile the two. And for my brand in particular, we actually never see the human going away, but I think what that does is up-levels up the expectation of when you do actually interact with a human, and maybe the human is a hologram, right, at some point in the future. But what then becomes the expectation of the value add of the human at that level? Because you're powered by mm -hmm. the technology. So I just think AI is one to be embraced. And I think the, the un unleashing of possibilities, we're barely scratching the surface. Great. Well, we're, we're nearly at time. Um, I just want to also say, the Suzy team, congratulations on pulling off this incredible event there. Speaker lineup is amazing. It's why I flew all the way from LA to be here. Uh, Lynn, thank you very much as well for, You're welcome, for, for sharing all these insights with everyone. And, it's and a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.